Former Major League slugger Kevin Millar joining us on the show. Kev, how are you, brother? Amazing introduction by you, Danny. That's why I love you. Slugger. I was a slugger. <laughs> how many uh, career home runs did you have? Just 170 circle in the pillows. Not a big deal for undrafted in St. Paul Saints. 600 bucks a month in 1993. Signed for $600 also, Dan. So I, I was living large and went to Outback Steakhouse and blew it that night. Best pitcher you homered off of? Randy Johnson went 4-4 four four that day, and then everybody thought I owned Randy Johnson. And then uh, I ended up going, I think, 0-40 for 40 from the next 40 <laughs> at-bats off Randy Johnson. So it didn't work out great. Did you ever close your eyes and swing? No. Uh, best home run. Let me get back to me. Best home run, Game 7, 2003, off Roger Clemens. Wow. How's that? Is that, that you- uncomfortable or no? Are we okay? For, it is for Clemens, yes. Very uncomfortable for Clemens. <laughs> is that where you put your head down and just say, just keep running and don't look up, don't celebrate this? No, I just, that, no, that's just where you kind of go, this is awesome. That's game seven, Yankee Sox, you know? Um, but yeah, that was probably my favorite home run. I mean, there was a three home run game against the Yankees that was cool, but we ended up losing that game in the ninth. So it wasn't that cool afterwards. I mean, it was cool because they had three, but. You kind of have that fake celebration like we lost. So, you know what I'm saying? You're yeah, happy. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like, but we lost. Yeah. You ever felt good after a loss? Is that one of those games? That one? Yeah. That one? <laughs> I took all my family to PF Yankees. I'm like, I didn't get three homers in the show in Fenway against the Yankees. I know we lost, but, you know, come on, guys. We're all right. Uh, reason why I wanted to bring you on, I, did you uh, do dip or chew when you were playing? You know what, Dan? I, I, I did. And I do. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, this whole thing has really opened my eyes. I know it's a bad habit. I, I don't, I try to do it around my children. I, you know, and now I golf a lot. So when I get outside in the golf course, I, I've been wired that way. And I'll throw one in. But it was funny because Tuesday I, I didn't grab my can going to the golf course after, you know, the, the whole Tony Gwynn uh, situation. So it's something that has opened my eyes. I want to quit. Uh, it's 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 not like I go through a can a day. It's I'm one of those just you know outside with the boys throwing in and uh, but there's got to be you know there's got to be a time when you just say enough's enough. How long have you uh, dipped? My first dip was in 1996. Uh, Pasquale Perez gave me a dip of Copenhagen, and uh, I got dizzy and I'm sweating. I'm in Dominican. I'm thinking I'm gonna I'm done. This is it. And for some reason, that was the, you know, got back, tried it again, tried it again. Next thing you know, it, it turned to Levi Garrett, you know, on, only on the baseball field. I never was a guy that needed it, you know, hotel rooms and, and, and on the bus rides and that. It was just kind of when I got to the field with the guys, I don't know if I thought it was the cool thing to do because that's you're a ball player or what, but 96. Performance enhancement? You know what, Dan? No, it's not a performance enhancement. It's an addiction. It's a choice. It's a bad choice. And I don't think, you know, it's a performance enhancement. We can get into this. I know there was an article written about it by a writer. Uh, Red Bull, you know, Coca-Cola, caffeine. I mean, uh, we can go down that road, but it's just a bad choice. It's not a performance enhancement. Well, Bob Klappish, who wrote the article for the Bergen Record, said that when he used it as a pitcher in college, he said he thought it was a performance enhancement, and maybe that was baseball's loophole to take it completely out of the game. I hate the fact that it took a death of a Hall of Famer for people to kind of realize what it can do to you. Uh, that that turned on a light or flipped a switch with you that, you know, Tony Gwynn dies. Now you start to reassess that. Why, why did it take that for you to go, hmm, maybe I don't need to do this? It's a great question. We know it's stupid every time you stick your fingers in there and grab a pinch. I, I think uh, you live in this world that times – Oh, you know, it's okay. It's not going to happen to me, right? It's not going to happen to me. I mean, I used to watch Johnny Pesky, bless his soul, but 83 years old with a, with a chew-in, walking around in full uni with a, a fungo, and he ended up passing away at 92, 93, 94, you know, but he did it 60 years. You know, at the end of the day, yeah. you're really playing Russian roulette. And some guys can smoke for 50 years and die at 90. Some guys, you know, my dad smoked for 12 years, started smoking at 37, had a quadruple bypass. At 45, because of smoking, he's, you know, he's, he's alive. But, you know, it just depends on the genetic gene pool. And I think that we live in this world that it's not going to happen to me. But when it hits home, again, you know, in a Tony Gwynn situation, uh, it, 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 you know, it just makes you think for a second. And I, got, I have four little kids. Yeah. You know, I mean, I want to be around. 
Talking to Kevin Millar, Major League Baseball Network. Um, I mentioned uh, Tanaka that, you know, a lot of times when you see these pitchers, even a hitter, first time around is one thing. It's the second time around when I always take note to see just how good your stuff is, and, you know, especially with the pitcher. Now, Tanaka did shut down the Blue Jays last night. He's faced the Cubs and Blue Jays twice. Cubs got him, roughed him up once, second time around. Uh, do you see that as the litmus test? You make it through this, you know, you know, baseball the second go round, uh, and then you find out just how good somebody is. Yeah, I definitely think the pitcher at uh, his caliber has the advantage no matter what. The first time for sure, he's given up. Ironically, he got his first W against the Blue Jays. Gives up two first pitch homers, Cabrera and Jose Reyes. It was just wow. And then you see him just <laughs> settle down. Boom. Uh, I, this guy stuff. There's certain guys, you know, you got the $150 million, you're like, wow, there's hype, blah, 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 blah. But this guy's stuff. We saw him pitch, Chris Rose and I, in Fenway Park against the Red Sox. He's got that different look. Everything's knee-high, below the strike zone, tremendous breaking ball, tremendous split finger, his fastball, but he's a location guy with, you know, above average breaking stuff. And in hitter's counts, can establish those pitches at any time. So, Dan, what makes him special is he's got a different eye of the Tiger. He's got that 94-95, and you know what? He's a winner. I don't care. He went 26-0 in Japan last year. He's now 11-1. and the guy, doesn't, the guy doesn't like to lose, and some guys have that knack, and this guy, I'm telling you, is special. Would you rather have Tanaka or Darvish? Tanaka. I mean, we were asked that question about two weeks ago. Darvish is remarkable. He's a high strikeout guy, but at times, I think Tanaka, watching both now, I know he only has 14 you know, starts in the big leagues, Tanaka, but he is more polished all the way around. Where is Justin Verlander, and if you find him, where is he going? It's, this is what goes on, and, I'm, and I, my whole thing is at some point in everybody's career, he's been a power pitcher, he's a star, he dominated his whole entire, entire life. Now you get to a point, his velocity's still there. He pitches at an elite level still, 92 to 94. He used to throw at 97, 98, 99, got it. But what happens, you have to locate this level, Dan. And you watch your starts, the belt high, the pitches up, middle of the play, after who you are, you're going to get hit. This is the big leagues. So I think Justin needs to go back to the drawing board. It's almost like the CC Sabathia situation. We know the velocity's down. So now CC instead of throwing that 0 2 1 2 fastball inside, it's not 97, 98 anymore back when, when he was with Cleveland. You know, now it's 91, 93. So he's learned how to work that two seam part of the plate. And now Justin, not saying he's lost that much velocity, it's not that. He just got to be more conscious on the location of his pitches now and not just be a thrower. I was watching uh, Angels last night, Mike Trout. He hit an impossible home run. He had two home runs last night. Uh, he, he's not stealing bases as much anymore. And, and you see this yep. with players that, you know, you start out with good intentions of being that 30-30 guy, and then all of a sudden you, know, you become a 40-20 guy or – where do you see Mike Trout being uh, in the next couple of years as far as what to expect offensively? I'm glad you asked that question. I just spoke about this with the guy at the golf course the other day, and I said, listen, I can't stand when they shut down these athletes, these guys that are stars. Like, I remember Griffey was a guy that ran and hit for power. And, you know, Alex Rodriguez ran and hit for power. And then all of a sudden they get to a point, they start hitting homers, and they don't run anymore. Mike Trout is a guy that should steal 30 bags for the next – Five years, right? I don't, you know, his body, he's fast, he's strong, he's dynamic. I just think that you're looking at a player, and I don't know, I never saw Mickey Mantle, Dan. I know you're way older than me. Mm -hmm. Did you just turn 75? How old are you? Uh, I'm old enough to kick your ass. <laughs> so, guys like yourself that watch Mickey Mantle, but is he the closest thing? To Mickey Mantle? I mean, if he was a switch hitter, that's what they say. He'd be Mickey Mantle. Yep. Remarkable, remarkable hand-eye coordination and power. The ball he hit last night, that down and in sinker, that's a 6-3 with 95% of the guys in the league. He takes that barrel to the ball and takes it left center to you know out in Cleveland. The kid is special, and what a good young man, too. Yeah, that was... I saw that one, and it reminded me of Manny Ramirez at Wrigley when he took one off the plate. And uh, Homer, you know, that just sometimes you look and you go, I don't believe what I just saw. Uh, your first career home run inside the Parker? Rick Aguilera. Rick Aguilera against the Cubs. A go-ahead inside the park home run, three-run home run. His first start with the Cubs, he just got traded from the Twins. I got a funny story, though. 
So I, I do the inside of the park, it, it hit over Sosa's head. He doesn't know where it's at. Freddie Gonzalez, the third base coach then. <laughs> and he's rounding me. I'm like, what's going on? I mean, someone had to fall over. So I'm safe. Rick Aguilera and my father, Chuck, are bowling in Valencia, California, in a league together, watching the game. Aguilera's dad is actually upset. Now, he's already had success in the big leagues. <laughs> this is my first home run. My dad's jumping up down, and it was like Rick Aguilera's dad walks off with his bowling shirt, you know, whatever his name was, Bob. <laughs> And so that was my first major league home run. I can't run a lick. You know that, Dan. And, uh, yeah, I got, a home, I got an inside the park home run in Fenway and Wrigley Field, ironically. Well, it helped you had Sosa out there. I had no clue what he was doing. <laughs> that's a fact. I, <laughs> I said something had to happen. That's, that's a fact. <laughs> uh, tell Chris Rose we said hello. Good to talk to you, Kev. All right, buddy. You too. Uh, Kevin Millar. Intentional talk weekdays on uh, Major League Baseball Network at 5 Eastern.